Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. My name is Julie McCrossan, and it's uh, my genuine pleasure uh, to welcome you this evening to this special wellbeing webinar on building resilience uh, for our teenagers during a pandemic, hosted, of course, by Walper Jewish Hospital and Friends of Walper. My name is Julie McCrossan, and it's my uh, great pleasure to be your MC this evening. And our focus tonight is going to be on what you've requested, which is hearing practical strategies for particularly parents and grandparents to support their, the teenagers in their life during this extraordinary time when so many people are experiencing anxiety and uncertainty and instability. Uh, I'd like to say before we begin that we're broadcasting to you on Aboriginal land. I'm on the land of the Ghana people in Adelaide and there's people joining us from all over Australia, although particularly, of course, from the land of the Gadigal people uh, of the Aora Nation uh, in the Sydney region. And uh, I acknowledge uh, elders past and present and emerging. Some very quick housekeeping. Uh, we cannot see or hear you this evening. The way that you can join us with questions, and we love your questions, is through the Q&A button at the bottom. You'll see it down there. If you click on that and put your questions in there, start putting them in now. Anonymous questions are welcome. All the questions will be brought to you anonymously uh, by our question moderator, Dr. Alan Schell, a, a general practitioner and a tremendous friend of the Walper community and a driving force uh, behind these community forums. And Alan will join us shortly. We will answer as many of your questions as possible. Of course, we can't get to them all or answer individual detail, but we will answer as many questions as possible. And we will send you an email at the end of the evening uh, so you can give us feedback uh, because we, we shape what we do based on what you tell us. So look, to kick off proceedings, it is my pleasure now to welcome Dr. Alan Schell. G'day, Alan. Thanks, Julie, and uh, welcome everyone. We, we have a very, very large audience tonight and uh, I'll let you know the numbers later, but we expect well over 400 people watching on what is really a very important um, topic for us all as grandparents, parents, and uh, young people, teenagers. So welcome to you all. Uh, and in the background, you'll see that uh, Walper also is celebrating 60 years of uh, working in this community. Certainly, and that's right, thank you. <laughs> and we are very proud to have been part of the community and in presenting the wellbeing programs for well over, I think it's 17 or 18 years. So I can only say thank you to Julie for being a very fantastic moderator and very interested in what we do. And to our guests this evening, we, we actually do have some important young people to talk to you, as well as professional people involved in, I guess, mental health and support. Uh, we will be having uh, opportunity for questions. In fact, I already have a number of questions that have been posed. I would hope that many of those questions will actually be answered during the night, as is often the case with very professional people that we've invited along uh, to the panel, and, and Julie will introduce those shortly. So without further ado, I'd like to say thank you for you all being here tonight. Uh, we will have this event recorded uh, for your uh, cognizance, and it will be available uh, through the WAPA website. We also have uh, some surveys and some polls, which Julie will uh, present to you shortly, which we'd like to know your answers about the, uh, some very straightforward questions. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Julie, who will introduce our speakers and the poll. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much, Alan. And this is deaf sign clapping, and I'm a great believer we need to uh, send connection and warmth uh, through the digital airwaves. So uh, even if you're at home and we can't see you, I urge you to clap anytime someone says something that uh, you concur with. So look, uh, if you've just joined us, people are coming in, please put your questions in the Q&A. Dr. Alan Shell will mod uh, look at them all through the evening and bring as many of them uh, to our panel and our student guests as possible. Now, just before we begin, we have got some questions so that you, the audience, can tell us something about you. So I'll ask Michael, our tech host, to pop up the first of our poll questions. I'll read it out, you'll answer it, and then I'll read the answer. Question one, we'd like to know who's in the audience tonight. So if you're a teenager, a parent of a teenager, a grandparent of a teenager, a concerned community member, a teacher or other educational professional or a mental health professional, please tick uh, the box or boxes that apply to you.
Thank you, Michael. The answers, please. So teenagers, 3%. Parents of a teenager, 64%. Grandparents, 22%. Concerned community members, 7%. Teachers or other educational professionals, 11%. And mental health professionals, 11%. Thank you. Our second poll, please. My teen is, and you choose just one, coping, barely coping, needing help, receiving help. And if you are a teenager yourself, please answer. And the answer please, Michael. 50% say their teenager in their life is coping, 22% barely coping, 14% needing help, 14% receiving help. And just a reminder that as we do this poll, we have uh, 267 people uh, responding. Our next question, please. What are your top two concerns for your teenager at this time? And you can answer uh, more than one if you wish. Use of electronic devices, top two. Use of electronic devices, social isolation and withdrawal, missing milestones such as school trips and graduations, anxiety or depression, use of drugs or alcohol, other. Answers, please. Use of electronic devices is a concern for 57%. Social isolation and withdrawal, 71%. Missing milestones, 39%. Anxiety or depression, 43%. Use of drugs or alcohol, 2%. Other, 4%. Our next question, please. My teenager is just one answer, please. Focused on schoolwork, finding it difficult to focus on schoolwork, trying their best to stay motivated, refusing to do schoolwork. Answer, please. Focused on schoolwork, 19%. Finding it difficult to focus on schoolwork, 41%. Trying their best to stay motivated, 35%. And refusing to do schoolwork, 5%. Now, I have to tell Michael, our tech host, that I wasn't good at maths at school, and I'm not sure if we've done four or five poll questions. If there is another one, could you pop it up now? There is. Are you worried about the long-term effects of these extended lockdowns on your children, your teenage children? Yes, no, not sure. And the answers, please. Are you worried? Yes, 66%. No, 13%. Not sure, 21%. And I'm pretty sure, Michael, that's the, the last of our questions. And so thank you so much uh, for everyone uh, for answering them. Tremendously interesting results. Uh, I'd like to welcome now, uh, first of all, two members of our, our panel who are joining us this evening. If I could ask Dr. Paula Robinson to turn on her camera and, and also Ashley De Silva to turn on. So I'll introduce, first of all, uh, Dr. Paula Robinson is the CEO and Executive Director of the Applied Positive Psychology Learning Institute and a registered psychologist. She's worked in over 500 schools with a very, very strong focus uh, on uh, positive psychology and also prevention. So a welcome to you and we'll hear from you shortly with the deaf sign clapping. And welcome also to Ashley De Silva, who's the CEO of Reach Out. And Reach Out is an online uh, set of mental health services 
and it's a, a supportive, safe and anonymous space. And it's full of tips of all kinds uh, for people in schools, for parents, for grandparents, and of course, uh, for young people themselves. So welcome to Ashley. And if I could ask our, our three young people to join us tonight, Ruby Cooney, uh, Mushka Berger, Berger and Toby Holland, if you could all turn on your cameras and if you could wave uh, Ruby so we know you. Ruby Cooney is uh, in year 10 at Skeggs Darlinghurst and, uh, and I'm looking forward to speaking to her in a moment. Mushka Berger, am I pronouncing your surname correctly, Mushka? If you, do you want to turn your mic? Yeah, all good. Mind? Yeah, all good, <laughs> thank you. And, and uh, Mushka's from the Kessatora College. And Toby Holland uh, is in year 11 and you're from Cranbrook. So welcome to you all. And thank you so much for being part of it. And I should say that uh, Professor Patrick McGorry is at a really urgent meeting. This is a time of great pressure on people working in this field. He will be joining us as soon as possible after 8 p.m. And I know Paula may have to leave us a little early as well. And she will let us know when that's necessary. Look, Ruby Cooney, let me come to you in, the, in year, year 10. We've had a quick chat before, and you said at one point, it feels like the end of the world. What an extraordinary thing to say. What were you thinking of when you said that? Well, I think that this is something, the COVID, obviously, and the lockdowns and the quarantining, it's something that we've never had to deal with before as a society, as a cohort, as teenagers and as parents as well. And because it's something that we've never had to deal with before, there is no guidebook. There, our parents can't say, oh, this is what helped me get through it. And there's no one to really tell us what to do, which way to go, how we can get through it. So it feels like our world's kind of ending at the moment. We can't see our friends. Our only connection to reality, it seems, is through social media, which is ironic because social media, we all know, is certainly not reality. So it just feels like we really have to find something within ourselves to keep our world going. And, and, and I will come to what you have found within yourself. Uh, but just staying with the challenges for a little bit longer, you, you said to me that one of the big challenge for you, apart from the fact that your parents and you are learning together, where normally they're probably full of, probably too full of suggestions, but mm -hmm. a, another issue is that you're a very goal-driven person and that's made this hard uh, because what's the goal? Where's the finish line? Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, at school, pretty much, it's all about goals. We have our goals set for us most of the time, whether that's um, exams and finishing exams, getting to go on holidays. There's always a goal, a reward, and then a break, it seems. And I'm very goal-driven. I find that if I have a goal, I can work to achieve it much, much better. And it helps me stay on the right path and helps inspire me to work hard. But there is no finish line at the moment. We don't know if it's if my goal is, is studying for exams, we don't know when exams are going to be. If my reward is going to be going overseas or going on holidays, we don't know when the holidays are going to be normal or if it's ever going to feel like a real break. So you really have to find small goals, small things that you can achieve, because if you're not achieving anything, you don't really feel like you're getting through it. And achieving doesn't have to be, I don't think, a, doing a test or learning a new skill. It can be waking up early in the morning to watch the sunrise. I know my sister who's in year seven did that this morning. And that was something she found really rewarding and really enjoyable. And I've been going for swims at lunch in the water, which is very cold, but it's very, it helps wake me up and it makes me feel like I'm achieving something. It feels like a reward for a hard day's work, which I think is really important. You know, um, Ruby, just to give the audience and our guests a, a sense of just how a goal directed you are, you have a black belt in karate. Now remind us how old you are. I'm 16, yes. um, I turned 16 in July. I got my black belt in karate last September and that was actually a COVID goal pretty much. I have been doing karate for about 10 years and that was something that I achieved last September. And I was very proud of myself because despite COVID lockdown and everything, I continued to train and that was a goal that, something that really kept me focused because I was able to work towards that. Hey, um, just let's come to what is really helping you and and, and one of the things you mentioned was that you're quite enjoying seeing teachers at home. Can you just tell us why that's a coping mechanism? Because in general, you're getting a bit sick of Zoom, as I understand it. So we thank you for coming tonight. But <laughs> tell us about being able to peek into people's homes. I'm looking in your room right now. Well, <laughs> I I'm going to blur myself if I can remember how to do it. Anyway, I'll do that in a sec. <laughs> well, I think 
having being able to see that a teacher's at home that they're not just at their desk at school as we would normally see them makes it feel like we're all in this together because you can see the teachers at home you can see the paintings on their walls things that make their lives their lives and we're so used to thinking that our teachers don't really have lives outside of school and outside of teaching us and it's just makes us feel like we're not alone and like the teacher at the end is experiencing the same thing that we are and it really helps when zoom becomes monotonous and it just feels like we're all isolated because we can't see anyone to realize that everyone's together in this yes you've got something profoundly in common with your teachers suddenly and so that's very interesting um uh, you also think one thing that helps is that your parents talking to you um because you have a sense of you, you want them is it talking to you or listening to you because you said you have a sense of that the best years of your life are slipping away and you want them to recognize that talk to that well I think it's really important well it's a particular issue for us at the moment as teenagers because what we've been told at the most exciting years of our life the best years the later high school years are essentially being taken away we don't have those milestone landmark moments like the socials the formals getting the l's that i was supposed to do that actually and then we were locked away but it's and it's just really important that i think adults recognize that and help us to kind of work through it because it's a really big deal for us that the best years of our lives that is supposed to be spent with our friends and um, celebrating being young and living aren't really existing for us at the moment. And so I think it's really important that we have these conversations with our parents, but these conversations are really difficult most of the time. So I think you need to have them when you are doing something that you both enjoy, whether it be going for a walk together, watching a show together that you both enjoy, something that means the awkward conversations or the difficult conversations can flow freely. Like if you're going for a drive, because it seems like everyone at the moment is just stuck at home with each other. And even though it's a lot of time with someone, you don't seem to be having the important conversations, I find. So I find I talk best with my family, with my mom, when I'm going for a walk around our neighborhood, when I get to talk about the things that are upsetting me or making me feel anxious about the future. And then it just feels like it flows more freely, the conversation. I'll come back to you in one second, but I want to come to Toby Holland, if I may. You're in year 11, Toby, I think, at, at Cranbrook. Uh, anything that uh, that Ruby said that uh, that you uh, agree with before we talk about other things? You know, did anything she said really strike you as similar to you? Uh, yeah, just sort of how it's a bit ironic that social media is the only way we can sort of connect with my friends. I know I've sort of been benefiting from like late night calls and stuff and going and playing games with my mates. So I uh, similar to that, and also just yeah, a bit of a lack of lack of end for school. Like yeah, you've got setting goals for exams and stuff then you don't know how much that exam is going to mean because they've sort of messed around with how much that, that exam matters in retrospect and yeah just that sort of stuff I agree with. You know it hadn't actually occurred to me just how destabilizing it must be like I, I'm going to come in a moment to Mushka I think he's in year 12 but the, the fact that the HSC is moving you know it's always been this kind of big monolith hasn't it at the end of the school experience and for it to move must be like a a mountain moving. I mean, I know you're in year 11, but did you feel slightly disconcerted by that, Toby? Uh, yeah, just because, yeah, you sort of work towards something for your entire schooling experience, and then to see that it could actually be changed and using year 11 marks instead of year 12 is becoming more important. It's just a bit putting things in perspective and making you realise that everything you do could count at some point. So that's almost a bit of a motivation for me. You it struck me when I spoke to you earlier that you actually think one of the thing that's the things that is helping you is exams, and I nearly fainted with that because while well, I've gone to uni and all the rest of it, I was never I, I never loved exams. So what is it about exams that you're finding positive? Um, well, I'm sort of a bit lucky that I, I I have exams right now, unlike Ruby who said that she didn't know when hers would be, but um. I've just sort of found that it's put me back in the exam zone of I don't need to be able to go out and see people as much as I used to do. I can just exercise like once a day and then I can be studying and stuff. And I know that that's what's important. And so it's just sort of made me realize that, you know, business as usual and taking my mind off the things that I can't do because I know at this time of the term, I wouldn't be doing that stuff anyway. And you're, you feel lucky, don't you? Because you actually like school. Yeah, exactly. I think that online school, I think it's been bad for a lot of people who 
don't put in the ethics obviously it's very easy to just turn off your camera and your microphone and sit at the like you're sitting at the back of the class but I genuinely like school and so I'm enjoying not not enjoying but I'm being able to be motivated throughout school and pay attention and that sort of stuff which is paying off you know what uh, if one of your friends who, who was drifting a bit and perhaps um you know you're a little bit worried about them you know what, what would be what would what would be your suggestion to them about what they might be able to do? Oh, well, I'm a bit of a silver lining guy. I'm sort of just thinking, you know, September 13th, I can get out with five or more friends, even though there's not much I can do. That's still four more friends than I could before. So I'm just always sort of reminding people of that. And yeah, just we'll be over soon. We're all, we're all going through the same thing, stuff like that. And have you always been like that? Or is that something you think your parents or grandparents encourage, you know, that, that, capacity to see the glass half full uh i'm not really sure to be honest i have never really had to be using it in this in this regard to the scale so it's a bit new but yeah um i know team sports is something that you love you play a number of teams sports basketball and soccer i think and that's been really challenging for you and the tighter restrictions on who you can exercise with tell us about that that impact on you yeah, it was the sort of perfect almost holiday, which is a bit weird to say, was at the end of the last holidays when it was you could exercise with 10 in groups of 10 because it just meant I got to see all my friends every day and all we could do was play sport. But since then, obviously, we're only allowed one person. It's really been restricted about what I can do, where I can go, and just who I can even see because you got the five-kilometre bubble. And, it, yeah, it's just affected the way that I would normally operate in my day. Because you miss the interaction, don't you, at school? Yeah, and and, exactly. and you don't feel Zoom is comparable. No, yeah, exactly. There's there's obviously something different to when you're playing at a park with mates and stuff to when you're just sort of going on call or just playing with one mate. Look, I, I'm very mindful you're in the, you've got exams on, but I want to just hear from Mushka and then I'm going to just get some uh, uh, feedback, really, from our adult panellists before I let our senior students go. So if I could welcome Mushka... Uh, Berger from Kesatora College, and you are in year 12. So uh, just to kick off, when you heard that you t the exams were moved, possibly moving, what, what happened inside you? Well, personally, it was um, quite unmotivating. I know, <laughs> yeah, it really crushed. I know for me, like academically, like Ruby was saying before, having that goal and really working towards that has been such a solid way of just keeping motivated, keeping on track. And I know just for me and friends of mine, we've spoken about it. It's really just so confusing and so hard to keep up with all these dates changing. And like, you've really went through your whole school career, as they say, um, looking forward or just counting down to this end goal, this end moment, taking the HSC. And uh, yeah, it's just so hard not knowing when that's gonna come and when you could just finally say bye. Could I say to our viewers, uh, we will be uh, taking some questions from you uh, after we've heard a little bit from our two panellists. And so please uh, get your questions in the Q&A and uh, Dr. Alan Shell is, uh, is running through them and will bring them to us shortly. Now, I, I, I want to come to the, the ways that you're, you know, keeping your spirits up in these difficult times, Mushka, but just to get a sense of what you've found a bit hard, you know, while you love your big family, being stuck at home and away from your network of friends has been really hard for you, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. I know Zooming, that can be really a struggle in so many ways for lots of different people, like in their own way, of course. But for me, just the noise and all of us just getting our devices out, trying to Zoom, getting on each other's nerves. <laughs> like, oh no, I'm taking the couch, you take the table. It's just it gets a lot. I know with, I'm sure there's people with big families on here and staying at home all together, cramped up sometimes. It can get difficult. Um, yeah, but you really, we're all making it through. We're all going to just power through this as best as we can. So, just, uh, no, uh, yeah. Oh, no, I understand that. But, you know, um, often year 12 students meet together, don't they, in libraries? Yeah, and yeah. It's a joint. Oh, 100%. So, yeah. so what, what would you have been doing if, if you weren't in lockdown and what are you doing now yeah, in so, terms of studying? Yeah, in terms of studying, I know personally and, of course, like it's a well-known fact, I'm sure if there's some evidence on that, that studying in groups or being in that social setting, you all kind of motivate each other to keep going and 
Um, yeah, I think just with COVID, that's all been taken away and that's taking a toll on all of us. I know some of my friends have actually enjoyed that, just being independent, staying on track. They have their goals, not distracted by their friends, like getting them off their work. But uh, I know personally not being in that setting of school every day, coming in and just, let's say, going to the library after schools and all working together, it's been hard to really stay on track and remember that like oh that's due soon or you know I really should be going back to work and not spend that time scrolling on Instagram it just gets hard sometimes to stay focused alone well let's hit, get, uh, conclude with your your uh, what is helping you and exercise is big for you yeah definitely I know staying active taking runs walks even there's tons of home workouts or yoga anything that works for you that's really been great to just kind of let out that anger, let out that aggression or annoying feeling that's being just built up over this time in lockdown. And I think it doesn't even have to take so long, like 10 minutes, five minutes really does wonders. Yeah, amazing. And you FaceTime with your friends and your grandparents. We've got grandparents on. So tell us why, why are they important as well as your friends to actually see their faces? Well, I think that FaceTiming your loved ones, especially I know like I have my grandmother, my grandfather overseas at the moment, one pair of them. Um, and just really getting that human connection back. I think we're all stuck in our all in our little bubbles. And it's great to just reach out, see how they're doing, just have a conversation and just build that relationship because it's really important and it's so special. We should all really cherish that because you know, you really can tell, especially in these times, how valuable family is and how important it is to just really stay connected and stay together. In a funny way, that's a positive. We don't take each other for granted anymore, do we? Mm -hmm. At all, I don't think. Um, you, you're really into to meditation and so on, and you, you do use apps. That's one of our topics tonight. So uh, tell us what you use to help you. And also, if someone asked you for a tip on what helps cope with what you've been describing what would you recommend to your friends as well well i've been loving um headspace recently headspace is great they have some just explain what it is oh it's a great app it's orange and white and it's very easy to use you go on you could get a little sleep story you could get a meditation um yeah it's great love it i would definitely recommend and there's tons of resources online um, I know I just got an Apple Watch recently and they have this little breath thing where you just click on breathe and it like helps, <laughs> it tells you how to breathe slower. And it sounds so simple, but just taking that time to slow down. And in, although there isn't that much going on around, like going on physically, there can be a lot going on in your head. Um, and taking that time to slow down really can keep you grounded, keep you calm and have a great effect. Oh, look, can, can you, we all do a deaf sign clap, please, for our panel. And I'm very aware I said I'd let the senior students go. So could I come, if I may, to Dr. Paula Robinson, uh, who was uh, who a, a psychologist and works a great deal with young people, particularly in schools. Some feedback. What, what struck you as being um, uh, very helpful in what our young people have said? And any other quick reflections, please? Well, I think... Uh... Our wonderful teenagers on board tonight should be teaching all of us. Uh, I don't think you need me, quite frankly. I think I'm uh, very inspired to hear you. I love your honesty and I love your challenges. I love the positives that you've drawn as well. And uh, I I'm, feel very inspired. Um, being a scientist and a practitioner at the front line for a long time, um, as you were all talking, I was linking it back to the research and what we already know that works. And one thing we know is six, about 62% of the population, including teenagers, are resilient. You know, we are resilient. And that came out really in the data of 50% are coping and 22% are barely coping, but they are still coping. So, so you are resilient, you are very capable, I can hear it in your voices, and I have the pleasure of talking to many young people. I think if we did more listening and less talking to you and giving advice, I think we would all benefit more. Uh, I, I love to listen to you talk, 
and uh, get sick of hearing my own voice. So um, I'll just pull out a couple of, of points. And, um, and, and Paula, if I could, uh, just very yeah. quickly, I'd like to welcome Professor Patrick McGorry, who's joined us. And uh, 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 Professor Patrick McGorry is, of course, and I'll just get my cheat notes, a, a leading Australian psychiatrist, a professor of youth mental health at the University of Melbourne, and obviously a leader with Headspace. It's already cracked a mention tonight, Patrick. Uh, and of Origin Youth Health uh, in Melbourne, and of course, a former Australian of the Year. And Patrick, we've just heard from our three students, Mushka um, and Toby and Ruby, and uh, we're just getting a little bit of feedback from our two other two panellists before we let the senior students go. Thanks, Paula. Oh, thank you. And I, I try not to take long because there's so many great um, things to hear, but just a little bit of feedback to the three of you. Um, Ruby, I know it feels like the end of the world sometimes that I want to completely validate every single feeling everybody's spoken about tonight because there's good stuff and there's bad feelings and there's fear and anxiety and feeling flat and depressed. It's all normal. It doesn't mean you've got anything wrong with you. If you weren't feeling those things, I think I would be more worried. So please embrace the negative emotions as much as the good stuff because it all matters. And you said um, you're a goal setter. And I would say continue with that. But you, in the context of a pandemic, you just need to set them in a realistic way. You know, my goal might have been there before, but now I'm just going to drop it down a little bit um, because of the context that I'm in. And make your goals about what means the most to you because that makes it intrinsic, it makes it meaningful, and you're more likely to persist on task. So that's really important. Um, blue and green spaces, healthy digital diet, I'm all for that, but match it with being outdoors. Sunshine is very good for mood. Moving, your walk and talk, uh, I think um, that uh, you were talking about, also amazing with mum. I like to see people around the dinner table with no devices. And then we can be good listeners and grandparents and parents out there, we need two ears, one mouth, listen double to talking. We're always trying to give solutions. Our wonderful teenagers have solutions. Yeah. They're telling us, about, just listen, just listen to them talk. They're amazing. And, and, and uh, if you could just give some feedback to Mushka and Toby, because I promised them I'd let them go as close to eight as I could. Oh, okay. And Mushka, um, you, you also are amazing. You're missing your friends. The number one predictor of what I call mental fitness is connecting to other people. So, if, if again, if you weren't missing them and missing that face-to-face, -face, uh, it wouldn't be normal. So, yes, but the FaceTime and the, the Zoom is second best. And as a psychologist, I've been going on with my other friends learning how to bake cakes and you know doing really silly things and having a good laugh exercise is great and meditation is great provided there's no past real bad traumas in your life um, meditation can be absolutely fantastic I practice it myself because I get a bit anxious sometimes so it is very good for that um, headspace is a wonderful tool as are many others there's some great ones around um, Toby you talk about the silver lining really well done I mean find the silver lining in everything bad times do not last that is the key message so we know at some point in the not too distant future, we will be okay. So, and we will come out of this. And even though I know it's not normal uh, year 12 or year 11, you are living in extraordinary one in a hundred year times. And you will talk to your own children about this and you won't be like all the other years, you'll be unique. And it's like people that young people went through world wars and went through the depression. You're going through something and you'll be, you've got stories that are going to come out of this. So stay in the blue and green spaces, healthy digital diet, sit around the dinner table and put the devices aside. Um, I just think, you know, you're extraordinary and uh, I commend you for all of the good things you're doing, but let yourself feel bad. Sometimes it's fine. 
Now, Paula, thank you so much for that. And, and I want to reassure our uh, viewers that we will get some advice from you later about what if you have young people who, who don't have the resilient yes. skills yes. that we've heard tonight. But could I just get, Ashley, a quick uh, feedback from you to our, our three young people before we uh, uh, go to our first questions? Sure, Julie. I, um, Ruby, Mushka and Toby, thank you so much, guys. You shared so honestly. And actually, I felt exactly like Paula, where all I could hear was the, the advice I might have offered coming through at you, which is because you do know how you're feeling and you do know what's working for you and where it hasn't helped. So, um, so many ideas, Ruby, just to draw out one. I want to kind of acknowledge your comment around the fact that that you do need to find those avenues in conversations about the days that things aren't going well. And your idea around going for a walk or a drive to do it is something we hear actually really works for both young people and parents. And you, you kind of, the intensity of some of the emotions that you might be wanting to communicate at times feels more available to you when you're not sitting opposite someone and you're both kind of looking in the same direction and maybe you're on the move in a car or, or, or going for a walk. It's a great, great tip. Um, Mushka, I kind of want to acknowledge too that that you've had not just year 12 disrupted, but year 11 was disrupted as well. And that's something that's unique to this cohort of year 12 students, which differed from the, the, the cohort last year. And to kind of just acknowledge your perseverance and um, the motivation that it does take as that finish line keeps getting pushed out. Um, and Toby, great to meet you as well. And thanks for all of your, um, all of your advice and insight around this as well. Well, look, thank you so much, Ashley, and we'll come back to you to hear more about Reach Out, and I understand Professor McGorry may have to go before the end as well. So what I'd like to do is to say farewell and a huge thank you to Mushka and to Toby and to wish you well, both well with your exams. Could everyone do a deaf sign clap? And uh, thank you so much. And if you want to flee to your private lives, we just... Um, are so grateful for you being part of it. And we're going to keep Ruby on as a member of our panel. She's able uh, to stay with us, but farewell to Mushka and to Toby. And Thank hello you. to Alan Shell, Dr. Alan Shell. See you guys. Bye, good luck with the exam. Good luck. <laughs> um, it's welcome to Dr. Alan Shell, our, our uh, general practitioner, our marvelous uh, question moderator. And uh, do you want to hit us with a, a, perhaps a first question and I might come to Patrick McGorry first. Well, thank you. And uh, certainly some of the questions were well answered by our young panellists, Tamushka, Ruby and Toby. Thank you very much. And as with uh, Paula and Ashley, what can you say? I'm a grandparent and a parent, so I think that you've given us all some very wise advice. The question I think that perhaps in Patrick coming in here, and thank you for joining us, Patrick, is um, how do I actually get somebody to talk about their need for help. And we looked at the polls, we had 14% who needed help and 14% who were receiving help. And on the other side, we had 43% uh, of that 205 people who answered their concerns were of anxiety and depression. So obviously in Patrick's field and everybody else's, there are serious mental health issues that have been highlighted by this long-term COVID lockdown. So I guess that's a very important question to be uh, discussed right now. So, so is it essentially, how do you get people to open up and then what advice would you give? Patrick, thank you. Well, thanks, Julie. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm, I'm really sorry to be in and out tonight, but there are, because of the pandemic and, and the, the, the what we call the shadow pandemic of mental ill health, I, I, I've been caught up in some other meetings tonight, so I'm so sorry to um, you know be unreliable uh, for this wonderful event. And uh, it's such a pleasure to see you all anyway and wish you all the best. So, so to answer that that, that Great question. Um, yes, uh, um, we we have seen this rising tide of um, of um, mental ill health in young people, and it's not so much getting young people to ask for help. They're doing a great job of that, actually. The problem is that we're not able to provide the help in a timely and, and uh, effective way at the moment because of the challenges to all of our systems of care, like Headspace and youth mental health care generally. And we're we're working with government to try to make a much better and more more urgent response because. This pandemic is is um, catching up with everybody. I think, especially six lockdowns here in Victoria, um, people are exhausted, parents are exhausted, and um, you know I think um, the mental health workforce is, is tired too. So so it's it's a difficult situation, but that shouldn't stop anyone from reaching out to help. You still try, still talk to your parents, talk to your friends, and support each other in getting help if you really need it. And and um, what. You know, um, there, there will be a way. If, uh, you just have, might have to find it a bit harder to get access. And 
we are addressing that. We're trying to address that. Help does work. You know, I, I um, the, the work that I do directly in Headspace every weekend myself, um, I see the results of, of, of people getting help and benefiting and, and, and recovering and getting through. And, and it's, um, it's, it's, it can be life-saving. So please don't give up. That would be the thing. Alan's quite right. GPs are in a very difficult situation. They're seeing lots of these young people and they're having trouble getting access to services. But GPs can also do a lot. And GP is, is um, you know, um, they're so valuable to us and they work with our Headspace centres and, and uh we know this is a, a, a team effort that we're trying to work on, Julie, so and we will get through it. Mm -hmm. and, and can I ask you, uh, Patrick, and I'm going to come to Ashley in a moment too, so we can get a sense of the online resources. If someone has a young person who is asking for help and they can't connect yet to a specialist clinician, but if you were going to a GP practice, should you ask, Is there so, are, are there GPs here who particularly... Um, are, are engaged in mental health support? Is that worth directly asking for? Uh, can you I just say that question? Or Alan, sorry. Yeah, well, can I just say that uh, there are many GPs now who have done mental health courses, uh, certified uh, mental health practitioners. And as always, um, you know, with a change in the religious landscape, I can say over the years, people have come to me for counselling. And when that happens, you actually say, well, am I available to do that and do I have the expertise so I think that with Paul and with Ashley and with Patrick uh, we do have great avenues to teach the teachers so therefore we go to learn and I think that we'll all agree that there are some very good GPs out there and there's some who say look I can't help you but I do somebody who can um, and I think and Alan, is there yeah. anywhere you can go to see a list of the general practitioners who have done that additional training uh, sadly not really mm. Not that I'm aware of. Well, that's good for us to advocate for change, isn't it? To yeah. empower the consumer. But could I, if I may, Alan, I'll just come to Ashley De Silva. And if you've just joined us, Ashley is the CEO of Reach Out. Uh, can you, Ashley, explain what Reach Out is? And I know some of our audience are not familiar with your work. Sure, Julie. Um, so Reach Out is an online mental health service and it's been um, running for more than 20 years. So obviously very well-placed um, at this particular moment in time, especially, but but even prior to the pandemic, you know, we've had we have millions of people access the service every year, and a big part of why that is is the accessibility of the online space and the way that we co-design the service specifically for and with young people. And so, what what's available is information, kind of a lot of what we've covered tonight, actually, the ideas that Ruby was kind of sharing herself um, that come through from young people and are written in ways that young people would relate to it. So it takes out a lot of the kind of health or mental health feeling of this, these conversations that help increase the take up for young people who might just be exploring their feelings and not yet sure where they sit or how they feel. Um, we also have been part of that service, a, an online community of young people from across the country who come in online and they can actually share kind of in conversations like we're doing tonight through, um, through text though, what's going on in their life? What are the ways, what are they finding challenging? What are they finding helpful? And it's a really important part of that validation, which we spoke about earlier and the fact that sometimes there'll be feelings that are difficult and not positive. And it may not be that they're ready to speak to other people about it yet. And this is a safe space where they can open up. But Julie, I'd also touch on the parents aspect of what we do, because I saw the poll and just how many parents and grandparents were uh, with us tonight. And one of the things that we run is a, a companion service called Reach Out Parents. Uh, it's a free service and that offers a similar model to what I just spoke about, but also includes free coaching sessions, which you can do one-on-one -on -one with a coach. And we work with the Benevolent Society to deliver this. And that allows you to really focus around the strategies and particular issues going on at home. And we focus it particularly and very specifically on teenagers 12 to 18. So if you're a parent or grandparent or carer of a teenager, this is a service you could think about. Um, and the reason we focus there is that a lot of the, the challenges that emerge in a young person's life kind of are starting in that phase. And we've known through our research that parents often get taken off guard, that it kind of seems to come from nowhere and they're not sure what to do, when to be worried or what steps to take. So this is a great service for anyone who was kind of answering in that poll that you do wonder about where your um, teenager might be at and, and, and what steps you could take. Oh, thank you. Alan, I just wondered, do you have any questions relating uh, to support received online? Uh, because I, I thought we might deal with them now. And I'd also like to get some reflections from Patrick about the 
pros and cons of online support, but do we have any questions relating well, to it? Well, well the, the real questions were the ones that Ashley's just answered that they're asking, where can I get help? And, um, and the second one, which is very good for grandparents, how do I stop interfering and seeming like I'm interfering and worrying about the anxieties of my, my children, the parents, and their children, the, grand, the grandchildren? So I think, again, what Ashley's raised here, I think, uh, and thank you, I wasn't quite aware of that either. I think that's another resource that we have tonight, and we should know that everybody who's listening tonight we will email you back those resources that will be mentioned tonight and many more. So I think that having those resources out there, and thank, fantastic, Ashley, and I'm sure Patrick can highlight it as well, that uh, we need to actually, I guess, have some therapies for ourselves as the elders. How do we reduce the anxiety we have for our children to Ruby and her friends, you know, how we're feeling as anxious as you are, because, yes, we had, a, as, as Mushka said, we had this clear pathway to the HSC, which I did, and that was the end, and wow, we're over it. And now we have this, oh, we're not really over it yet, so what's happening? So... Yeah. Uh, May I come to Patrick and then to yeah. Paula on this topic of advice to parents and grandparents, how to be helpful and what harm to avoid, particularly if you're anxious yourself? Yes, thanks, Julia. Look, um, I think um, I very much agree with what Alan was just talking about. The, the scaffolding around young people um, is essential for them to make the transition to adult life, you know, uh, um, in, in, a, in, a, in the best possible way. And, uh, and the scaffolding at the moment, being the parents, the schools, the universities, um, the teachers, all of that is very frayed. It's very fragile, thanks to the pandemic. So the parents themselves are, are, in, are, are, are need, of, and grandparents too, to pick up Alan's point, all of those people need support as well. And, and it, it's, it's like a very vulnerable system of, of, in the society at the moment. So, and that's having secondary effects on, on the young people. Um, they're very sensitive to that, the peer group as well. So, so all of the things that support young people in the transition to adulthood are, are really much weaker than they normally are. And that's probably one of the contributors to the anxiety that they're feeling um, very much so. The online, obviously, Richard does a fantastic job, and we love to collaborate with them both through Origin and Headspace. And great to see Ashley tonight. Um, we've developed online platform or platforms of care to complement the, the face to face, so that a whole rich array of coping strategies, support networks, peer moderation, clinician moderation is available to young people 24 7 through this platform of care called MOST, developed by my colleague um, Mario Alvarez. It's become it's becoming available across Victoria and hopefully soon in Queensland and ACT. And we had, I had, I heard from the New South Wales government today that they've put up a proposal to, to link that um, in New South Wales in, in a pilot way too. So online, it's not a replacement for face-to-face, for -face. it complements it. And the work of Reach Out is very much in that space. It's probably, you know, the most successful, you know, platform that, that we have in terms of information and support. But, but we're, we're, we're trying to weave the, the online world into, into our clinical care because that's where young people also live. Exactly. Paula, you're can I, Oh, can sorry, I just, I'm just, you go. On that point, well, we do have now happily quite entrenched telemedicine consultation. And so if you do have a, uh, an opportunity, and in fact, with uh, psychologists as well, so for GPs and psychologists, telemedicine, seeing specialists is there, can be used then you can typically now book a, a time with your GP or specialist and or psychologist to have those sessions help you cope if that's required. Paula can I come to you now for your thoughts on, uh, on what uh, parents and grandparents can do and I think one of your messages is model the behaviour yourself that you want to see in your teenagers which may be relevant at this point. Yeah, I think having worked in over 500 schools and certainly worked with um, these sorts of issues, I think uh, we've covered clinical and I think there are great support networks. And But what I want to say is what I'm hearing a lot in schools is we're talking so much about anxiety and depression and chronic stress is I some of our young people think that that's what they've got. They think, oh, I'm, I'm depressed. They're not often not clinically depressed. They're, they don't have an anxiety disorder. Yes, they're feeling flat. Yes, they're feeling anxious. But they're probably more in that languishing, struggling stage. They don't necessarily have a mental disorder. Now, my beef in this area is we're using the language so much 
and what we focus on grows. So I like to think that we're using, uh, we're validating the negative feelings very uh, sincerely and talking about those. But what we focus on grows uh, and we can prime the brain with language that is about um, solution, uh, solutions rather than problems, um, mental fitness rather than mental illness. Um, we are capable. Talking about your children's strengths, you know, what, what do I see in you in, during this time that I've really admired? Um, I think GPs need to have more... Uh, prevention understanding of what can help to build mental fitness and well-being and stop us from moving too close to mental illness. And I know a friend, uh, a colleague in the UK is working with the government there to give GPs scripts, actual, it's kind of like a prescription on what you can do uh, in your daily life to prevent and have higher quality of life. And if you do even these five things every day or every week, you're going to feel more energy. You're going to think more positively. You're going to be able to cope better. And I think um, it's like heart disease 20 years ago. We waited till people got sick. But I'm very much in the prevention area and I want to see people adopting these things in schools their GP saying oh you know there's some really great things you can do right now to help you cope better and and also looking at both sides of the coin. Julie could, could I just jump in there and, and uh, um, I think what Paul is talking about is highly complementary to what we're talking about in terms of recognition yeah. of mental ill health and in, in heart disease the example you just used we, we, of course, we, we aim for prevention wherever possible, but we also make sure that as soon as someone's got chest pain, we, we step yes. in and help them. So it's, not, it's a false dichotomy, really, that, that we must avoid here. We've got to do both. And, and you can bridge it, actually. The most platform that I, I was referring to, all of, the, all of the therapeutic interventions there are couched in the language of positive psychology and coping. So it, it's, there is a way of getting a sweet spot here. But you know, the, the, the problem that I see every day is young people who, are, who actually are clinically, you know, distressed and, and actually functionally impaired, uh, often not able to go to school. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that, that's a very serious problem. But so we've got to address both levels, yeah. I guess. And I see the opposite. Um, I see the one in four, one in five, that uh, exactly what you said, Patrick, but I also see the other four or five. Yes, uh, yes. You know, that they are, they're wanting to learn new skills and, and activities and techniques. They really want to learn. And yeah. we should be teaching it from a young age. Yeah, totally. I, I was just thinking, can I ask Ashley for a comment? Because it's quite an interesting discussion they're having, and I won't try and summarise it. Your thoughts on what's just been discussed? Yeah, I completely agree. Like that, with Pat's point here around that it is both, but also the the language, Paula, that you were talking about, and how oftentimes the language that's gets that's getting used is not necessarily the the kind of technical experience that's happening in terms of anxiety or depression. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of work, and this is why language matters a lot in these conversations, mm -hmm. and it's why we do so much work to translate these conversations through the lens and life of young people. Um, and I was interested, Ruby, um, one of the things I wanted to circle back and ask you is, we, we've done quite a lot of focus groups with young people during COVID, and it's how one of the ways we kind of look to adapt the service to make sure we're staying across the sentiment and feelings as they shift and evolve throughout this. One of the things we hear is that um, it's the uncertainty of the future and that that's kind of really crippling for a lot of young people, that sense of loss about what it is. You kind of use the language like it feels like the end of the world, which yeah. I think really sounds like another way of saying something quite similar. And when you talked about going for a walk with your mom and um, the conversations you have, a tool that we've heard that can be quite useful is that is, is asking um, a, a young person or a teenager, like, hey, how are you going today on a scale of one to 10? You can just simply give one number instead of trying to find the words to describe how you're feeling. Because we've heard that young people are feeling a little bit over being answering the question of how are you? And I wondered what you thought about that idea and, and what you kind of see happening with your friends. Well, I think that often it's really hard to put the feelings that you're feeling into words because like we've all talked about, this is probably one of the first times in a lot of teenagers' lives that they're facing this kind of level of uncertainty and a lot of emotions all at once 
And though we know, I've been reading some blog posts on social media about how our emotions last supposedly only nine seconds, I think, or something like that, but it's our attitude that is what stays. And I think it's really difficult to put this attitude into words and to explain to someone, no matter how well-meaning they are, how, they, how we're feeling and because they're not our age and they don't really understand because everyone is going through something different, even though it's seems to be the same situation mm -hmm. so I think the giving a number is a really great way of summing up exactly how you're feeling with all, without using all the words to describe all your emotions and the way you were feeling this morning and the way you were feeling before the walk the way you're feeling now and the way you'll probably be feeling tonight I think it's just this huge range of emotions that are really great if you can sum up sum them up in one number yeah Great, thank you. I, I want to come to you too, but could I just let everybody know that uh, Professor Patrick McGorry has had to return to a high level meeting, which is dealing with uh, issues to do with service provision. So we thank him and uh, for his time with us. But uh, just before I come, yes, we do this thinking, thank you. Just before I come to Alan for some more questions, I wanted to ask you this, Ruby. I took part of that conversation between Paula and Patrick McGorry to be, that challenge of getting the distinction between uh, the natural feelings uh, of disorientation and distress that may occur when such an extraordinary world event is happening, you're not even going to school and you're not sure when it's you're going to go back. So that it's, it's absolutely normal to feel some upset and that a, a, a focus on um, finding what we can be grateful for and do positively to maintain ourselves will work for a, a very substantial uh, uh, even almost a majority of, of young people. But then there's that finding that other group of young people who may be in some form of serious trouble. And uh, as I understand it, there has been an increase in some states and territories of presentations and accident and emergency with self-harm or even attempted attempting mm -hmm. to take your life. So there is some hard evidence of youthful distress. Yes. And so I guess my question is this, and I know it's hard because you're dealing with people predominantly in the squares like we are now, but you know, do you think, how hard is it to tell if you have a friend who is in serious enough trouble that you might tell your mum and dad and, or you might tell your school principal or you know, that you think, oh golly, they might need some help rather than just they're all a bit upset like the rest of us and we can sort this out together? What would you say to that? Well, I think it can be often difficult to tell because every day seems to be different for everyone and our highs seem to be at different times to our lows to everyone else's. And so I think sometimes someone that's super bubbly one day can have their camera turned off and not want to speak the whole lesson the next time. And it's hard to know whether they're just having a bad day or whether it's an issue that you need to follow up on. Often if I think one of my friends is going through something, I'll text them or call them. I'm not actually that good on the phone, so I'll do a FaceTime, <laughs> but just to kind of suss out what I think is going on. And if I think it's, if I notice that maybe they're not turning the camera on for the rest of the day or the rest of the week, then maybe I'll mention it to my parents or mention it to my form teacher if they're in the same form as me and say, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but I think blah has, might be going through something. She seems a bit sad recently. And I think it's good to let the teachers or let the professionals sort this out or find out what's going on, because I think that I can only do so much and I don't want to, because there's a fine line, I think, between kind of stepping into someone's business and going where you shouldn't and taking care of someone. And I think you should do your best to find, make sure that your friends are okay and that your friends are getting through it just as like just as much you would like someone else to do the same thing to you I think I'm not sure if that makes sense or if that no, was no, bit... that's extremely helpful and just a very quick answer from uh, from Ashley and Paul if you could because I want to come back to Alan but for, for any parent or grandparent watching this and we did have a number saying they were seriously concerned in our earlier poll what's our in a nutshell advice to them if they've got a child they're worried about now uh, we've heard from Ruby, she'd go to her mum or dad or a, a school teacher. Who should they go to if they're worried and, and they feel I need I need to get help for this person? What would be your advice, Ashley? Look, there is, so I'd say, for instance, even just on reach out, there are, there's a this is a really understandable concern parents have, and there's great advice there. But what I would and so go, please go there and kind of look for more detail. But my one takeaway would be that through these teenage years, even 
one of the key things that parents struggle with is how to stay connected to my teenager as they change and my relationship with them changes. And it's an understandable thing, you know, that the biology of what's happening in the teenage years is that they're becoming more independent and you're needing to kind of help them become independent. But at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, there is a higher risk of mental health issues emerging during these years. And, and so really, rather than kind of make it about mental health, there's this broader piece around communication and connection. And it's why I mentioned the well, the wellbeing score as a way of kind of building into your routine ways where you can talk about things that allow that kind of conversation to come up. And that's really the best kind of case scenario is that you've got strategies and ways of working with a young person that they know that that question, they know that there's a space, there's that walk in in your routine where they could slip it in if they felt um, they wanted to. And, 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 and that's really, I think, the thing I kind of ask you to reflect on most is where are those opportunities? And if they're not there, how do we get some of those things going? Because it's that ability to connect that's going to be, and to not be afraid, the other thing I'd add, squeeze in Julie, is to not be afraid of getting anything wrong in this space. So sometimes we hear that parents can be worried that they'll put ideas into their kids' heads when they ask or, um, or, or kind of be concerned that they're gonna make things worse. It's always much better to try having a conversation and accept that sometimes that conversation may not go well and it was really just one conversation. You can always circle back later. And if you're wanting to do more research and there are evidence-based um, resources like ours that help you break it down if that's something you're looking to do. Thank you. And and your tip, Paula, if you, you're really worried, what do you do and where do you seek help? Well, I think being honest with um, your teenage children is really important. And I think hearing your stories about when times when you've struggled to normalise it, because we don't speak about it the same as physical um, health and illness. So if they broke their arm or sprained their leg or something, we'd be talking about it openly. But then if it's a mental health uh, issue, it seems to be so stigmatised. So we want to normalise the language in the house around mental health, physical health, mental fitness, physical fitness. They're all important and all just another part of the body that's struggling. Um, so I think trying to give them examples of times when they have struggled um, because we all do, every single person, parents and grandparents will remember those times mm -hmm. and how they felt and what they did, or if they'd had a chance to go to their GP. And, you know, you can get uh, a referral from a GP uh, to see a psychologist, 12 sessions, get, get it back on Medicare. And let's just say, you know, normalise a little bit, say, well, we can have these sessions. Gee, what a gift, you know. Not only will you feel better, but you'll learn some great skills and, you know, we can do it through Medicare. It's very normal for people to do this. And GPs are great at doing that, uh, I find, the ones that I work with. So, and then also adding a little bit of prevention. Some of the things you can also do um, would be great here. And I think that's just normalising and, and saying it's okay. But certainly listening, looking for changes in behaviour, as uh, Ruby uh, put, I think is really, really important too. And just noticing and being there. I want to support you, talk to me, you know, just let's just have a confidential chat. You know, that's always helpful. We love to connect with each other. We're a social species. Look, thank you. And I, I guess I'd just slip in there and I'll come back to you now, Alan. You know, many of the schools our young people go to would have pastoral care oh, or equivalent. Yes. And that's another uh, direct source of help. But Alan, can I come to you for another question, please? Well, as always, our fine panellists and young lady here has answered too many of the questions, <laughs> but there's still quite a few left. One, in fact, is how do we encourage my child to reach out and speak to a counsellor. That, that seems to be always the, the argument. So how, and, and how do we, I guess, so you answered before that there are services and you've got it in, in yours, Ashley, and the Headspace as, as Mushka celebrated before. So I think that we've learned a lot of, there's opportunities out there for people to gain that access, but how do I convince or how do I talk to my uh, teenage son, it says here, uh, to actually understand they need to speak to someone, not me. They don't want to speak to me. How do I get them to speak to a counsellor? Can I come to Ruby first as a young person? You know, Ruby, I have to say to you, I have 
have had direct extended family experience of people with uh, about whom I was seriously worried. And I have to say, it can be, in my experience, and I'll hear from the uh, our adult panelists in a second, one of the hard things in life for me has been that some people will not agree to get help, no matter how seriously I think they needed it. And, and sometimes the seeking of help may not happen for two or three years after I, as a family member, might have thought that help seeking was a good idea. And I guess that you would understand even at, in year 10 that parents or grandparents can think, oh my golly, what if something happens because there's, the person's young? So have you got any tips for us adults? How do we get young people to seek help or accept help or even just to talk? Well, I think a reason that people don't want to seek help is because, as I think Dr. Robinson mentioned, mental health is highly stigmatized, which means that people are often in denial and don't want to admit that they might be struggling with something, but in the off chance that they are diagnosed with depression or a mental health illness because they don't want that to become them. And there's this fear of mental illness, which is quite irrational. And I think a key part in helping people to seek um, help for their mental health is telling, making them feel validated, making mental health normal, making discussing mental fitness, positive mental health and bad mental health normal and positive just as you would talk about physical health the way you talk about a good feeling and a bad feeling. And I think once it's become normal, then it becomes much more normal for you to seek help for something if it's thought of the same way as physical health is. And I think there are also different levels of health, help, sorry, that you can seek. Like Ashley mentioned, there are websites like Reach Out, which are really great because you can read those articles, which are super accessible to everyone. And you can get a bit of a broader idea about what you might be dealing with. And then parents can look at that as well and decide whether they whether it is categorized under the things on that website, whether they think they need to see a GP, a psychologist, whether it needs to go further. So I think it's really good to start with the discussion and then go on an online platform like Reach Out that has so much information so that you can be a bit more informed and, about where you want to go next. And, and Ruby, what strikes me uh, when I deal with young people is people want anonymity and they want confidentiality. And that can sometimes, how old are you again? 16. You're 16. When you're 16 or 17, it can feel hard to get that. So could I... Ask Ashley and Paula for their uh, quick comments, but could you address this question of to what degree can young people have confidentiality, confidentiality and an anonymity? Because that might be a barrier to seeking help, do you think? What do you think, Ashley? It is a component of it, for sure. And so there are elements of our service where you can have it, ha be anonymous, um, including the peer support forum. So we do have safety protocols in that space around being able to escalate if there's an imminent suicide. So we will still be able to kind of locate someone. Um, Could you explain that just a little more fully? So sure. what the young people can do and when you would uh, do uh, escalate and what that means. Sure. So any of the information that Ruby spoke about, you can access without needing to log in to reach out. Um, and so you'd be completely anonymous in that case. But if you wanted to kind of um, take up that forum space, which I mentioned earlier, where you can actually post and interact with other young people, um, you can use a pseudonym there. And so you're still relatively you know, hidden, um, but we as a service will have your IP address. And unfortunately, that's one of the things we sometimes have to use um, if we are working with a young person who's at risk of suicide, we need to be able to kind of make sure that we can get um, support services to their home and we'll use their IP address to do that. But, but and so though, though um, that's an important factor um, around wanting privacy, the three main issues that you might be hitting up against when young people seem to be either reluctant or um, uninterested in service support. And this comes up in our research time and time again, and it's part, and we try to cater to this in the design of reach out, is the belief that what they're going through isn't help worthy. So they think that this is just trivial. Surely this isn't what people need. Like people get need help going for other issues, not the one I'm dealing with. Um, or they feel that they should be able to solve it themselves. And so they've kind of got a tendency to want to kind of just get on with it and buckle down and solve it themselves. Or there's a fear of losing control and of having to kind of open up, disclose what's really going on, and then suddenly having adults and experts swoop in and they've lost control over it. And that's why I think it's important to probably know those things when you're facing this. The, the best case scenario is to, um, is to empower the young person in wanting to seek support themselves rather than to kind of 
thrusted on them. Now, I acknowledge there are there are a wide gamut of scenarios that you will be dealing with, and this advice is not for all scenarios. But ideally, you want to be able to kind of listen. It's what Paula spoke about before. Listen first as much as that maybe brings up feelings of concern because you don't want your young person struggling, try to step back and just let them talk. Really let them tell you how they're feeling. Ask questions, don't add judgment onto it. Um, and then in the right time in the conversation, you can introduce ideas like, you know, that sounds really difficult. You know, a lot of young people do feel this way. Would you be interested in speaking with someone about it? And if they say, no, I'm not interested in that, then you kind of explore something else. And, you, and this is where it helps to know what the options are that are out there. And like Ruby said, you could say, okay, you don't have to speak to someone, but do you want to learn a little bit more about maybe what's going on for you? You could do that without having to make yourself known. Um, and really what that that's a key part of this. And, you know, we, part of our service model is to help increase the mental health literacy of young people and help them become service ready should they need additional support. Um, and so I think it's about kind of knowing what services are out there so that you can gently kind of encourage them and be persistent, but respect that you really want them to say, okay, that one works for me. And I guess, actually, just before I come to you, Paula, one thing we have to be careful of is uh, not speaking as if all parents are good at it <laughs> or that some parents don't have mental health problems themselves and we know domestic violence is huge and we know it's on the increase at these times and we know excessive drinking and drug taking among parents is big so there's probably some grandparents on tonight who are worried about the parents as much as they are about the children so uh, you know I, I just needed to say that uh, if, if Patrick McGorry was still here um, I'd be raising that with him as one of the ways one distinguishes the young person for whom positive encouragement is the best way to go and for the young person who may be in more serious trouble because their family's in more serious trouble. I mean, I, I'm not sure if there's something to comment on that. I just more wanted to acknowledge that with the group. I think it's a, you know, it's a good point to make. My comment on that would be, you know, again, it's, it's why making sure that young people know what services are out there. You know, parents are one gatekeeping strategy to getting help, but a lot of young people and will kind of still find ways of Googling what they're going through and finding services. And so we want to make sure that we're making the mental health system well-designed for young people where it's not only about accessing it through, um, through someone at school or a parent, though those are really helpful. We wanna make sure that young people know what services are out there and that they're well-designed. So in that instance, that they've got duly unfettered access to, to support and that it's easy to, easy to find and easy to take up if they're finding that, that support at home or the environment at home is actually counterproductive. Paula, could I bring you in your... Practical advice to the person who's seriously worried about a young person, but they, but she, how do you get them to engage with the possibility of help? Mm. I think your point, Julie, is a very important one too, that parents, look, I'm a parent and have had taken two children through teenage years, as well as the knowledge and experience of being a, psychologi a psychologist, but we all struggle. Like, could we just be a family that acknowledges that, you know, that it's okay to struggle and, and say, you know, here's a story I want to tell you about myself. And gee, I wished I'd gone and seen somebody because from what I hear, you, you know, it can really be helpful. It can be anonymous, by the way. Um, as a psychologist, I can't reveal anything other than if somebody is in acute and real danger I'd probably have to do something but it's all anonymous your GP is anonymous uh, in terms of confidentiality um, we go then to a psychologist or a good counsellor mental fitness coach you know again language what do we want to call it you know um, it, anonymity is important to some people confidentiality is well that's fine like make sure you have that because you may not want to talk about it that, there's nothing wrong with that but parents are listening of course but certainly um role modeling times in their life perhaps when they haven't been feeling that mentally well and saying you know i went and saw somebody gee it was helpful or you know just giving them some uh vulnerability and we're not all perfect, so you won't always get it right. But I've found that transparency with my own children, but also in my clients and in the schools, really helps them understand it's okay. 
The other thing, there are other places for adults as well as young people to go beyond blue, Black Dog, Kids Helpline. Um, again, you can go on and get advice, get ideas. You know, we don't have all the answers. Uh, Ashley and I are trying very hard to help in this short time, but there's so many resources. But what I would say to you is to be really, really careful that you don't take advice from somebody who isn't qualified to give it to you. And I see a lot of that. So, so just be careful, be quality um, advice. And there is a lot and there's plenty of people to help, but normalize mental fitness, physical fitness, mental health, physical health. They're all important. It's a holistic approach. Look, thank you. Ellen, we're in a situation where uh, our panelists have calls on their time related to their work and we need to finish up a little earlier. But if there's an outstanding question that you think is uh, you know, very important and pertinent, let's perhaps have one last question and that will get us close to the finishing time. Okay, so one of our uh, psychologists in the audience has asked a good question about what if you have all these wonderful facilities online and then the other thing comes along with a lot of people raising the issue, um, we're talking about too much screen time. And in this lockdown thing, we're sort of forcing people and children to have with uh, doing some homeschooling. My wife does the better job, but doing with our grandchildren is that homeschooling puts them back on, on the screen all day. And then we're saying, no, you can't watch that. You can't watch that because you've been on the screen too long. So we have a bit of dilemma here, seeking advice, actually, as you say, online, and then saying, well, you, there's too much screen time. So what, what are the alternative? Ruby, what's the alternative? What, you know, I would say that having a routine is the most important. So you do your yeah. schoolwork. Then you have a break and then you do have some quality time with your favorite show if you want and you mix in exercise actually do yoga actually all the things that the young people talked about which i do as well i'm sure most of the people here do but all those things are question is too much screen time what do we do but equally if they don't want to access screens and and off-site or on sorry, online uh, sources what, what do we do it, it's a big dilemma right now isn't it Look, what I'd like to do, if I may, is get a quick comment from Ashley, because I know that he needs to go. And then I'm going to come to Ruby, I think, as our last commentator, our expert young person, if that's OK. So, Ashley, I know you're part of Australia's leading online source of help, so we'll acknowledge that. But what do you say to that concern of too much screen time? And now we're saying, look, there's all this help on screen. That's right. Yeah, it is a little bit of a, um, of a, a thing to get your head around, but I think you know, Alan, as you just shared, it is around having a good routine that incorporates time offline and time online. Um, but to add to what you've said, I think one of the things I would say here is that we do hear from parents this almost like this sense of guilt about how much time their kids are spending online. And I think this is one of those moments where we can also, once we kind of make the do the checks around making sure that there's some good plans to spend time offline, acknowledge that actually online in this moment, maybe online in consumption will increase. And, you know, it's part of that thing around saying that for young people, they're, they're using online, they're not just always sitting there on Instagram. They're, you know, it's where they're learning. It's also relaxing for young people to spend time online and it's a form of social, social connection. So my, I guess my invitation is just to kind of say, keep it in check, yes, but also don't be too hard on yourself if you see the, the screen time increasing because actually for young people, it's a legitimate therapeutic and relaxing form and of social connection. We've got to kind of let that stuff in in these times as well. And just before I come to Ruby for a final comment and we'll be back to Alan to close, I would say I happen to be working on a conference at the moment on perinatal mental health. This is the health of parents uh, before, during and after birth and also the, the health of the to a baby and the toddler. And there is some early research happening through lockdown research that some clients, adult clients, are preferring the online face-to-face -face, uh, um, support. Uh, one is that they respond to the face because it's about quality and not just quantity of time. We are actually filling the screen often when we're, we're talking, but also you know, there's no transport, there's no childcare, and, and that uh, some people enjoy the immediacy of an intimacy of the one-on-one -on -one, head to head. So it, we, we have to be, the research is yet to come out about what this period is doing in terms of our use of this medium. But a final comment from you, Ruby, too much screen time. What do you say? 
<laughs> well, I think, as Ashley said, it's really important to acknowledge that screens are a big part of our lives at the moment, whether it's on Zoom where we're learning, whether it's the way we connect to our friends, the way we stay in touch with the news, the world, what's going on. In lockdown, it's our only way pretty much of finding out what's going on around us. And ironically, by being on our screens, it's the only way of really connecting to the world. It's crazy, but... And I think that having a good routine and ensuring that you aren't spending hours online at one time is important, but I also think you do need to acknowledge that online and screens are a really big part of our day and getting help online is a really important way and helpful way of getting help. So I think acknowledging that and maybe moving other activities in between, having breaks between your online time, whether that's being with your family, going for walks, reading a book, listening to music, playing your instrument, things that I've enjoyed. I think it's important to take breaks from your screen, but also to acknowledge that your screen is a part of your life. Look, thank you. I, I've loved this conversation. I'm coming to Alan uh, to close proceedings and a bit of deaf sign clapping to introduce Alan. Uh, well, it's always lovely and actually very exciting to hear young people actually who have dealing with a difficult situation in a, a wonderful manner. So I can only really say a really big thank you to Ruby, Mushka and Toby for teaching us oldies uh, a thing or two, although we do know what you're talking about. We have, we actually have, I've got this gray hair because I've gone through many elements of life as well. Uh, this is a big one for all of us. You know, even the grandparents aren't taking it uh, that well. Um, that, that's a fact. So I just want to say thank you again to Julie for always being one, a, a wonderful mo moderator and a compare for this evening to Paula to Ashley and thank you to Patrick for really your professionalism and uh, your assistance and for everybody to know that all the references they've mentioned, we will try and get those to you by email in the not too distant future. So a very big thank you. And to all of the people who are out there, we had something like 209, over 290 people uh, sort of came online. So I think that's fantastic. Um, and obviously an important topic. Uh, I hope that, look, we really haven't been able to answer all your questions. That's a fact. Um, but you got a lot of those answered very well by all the people who were on tonight. And um, what can we say? It was a great evening. The next World Being Evening will be another one on uh, We Oldies, Healthy Retirement, Mental and Physical Aspects, Practical Strategies. So we hope that uh, parents and grandparents uh, will join us uh, for something that's, uh, you know, also here. When do you retire? Should you retire? Uh, thank to Walper for uh, obviously supporting this evening, the Wellbeing Evening. It will be, it is recorded and will be available on our website uh, in the next week. And to say a very big thank you to you all, and I wish you really well. Get vaccinated if you can, uh, as soon as you can, for our community, for all of us, and uh, stay well and stay safe. Thank you very much. <laughs>